morning. I'm Mike Fow, Chair of the UCSB Economic Forecast Project. And on behalf of the board and Peter Rupert, uh, I welcome all of you to our spring event. Uh, we begin, as we do each of our uh, UCSB Economic Forecast Projects, by acknowledging the key sponsors whose financial support allows us to have these events and bring in speakers from around the country. We thank at the beginning our founding sponsor, Union Bank, uh, who has been with us from the beginning more than 30 years. Its support is vital. Second, our platinum sponsor, Montecito Bank and Trust, which has also stepped up year after year. And this year, our gold sponsor, a new one, GL Bruno Associates. Thank you. <laughs> Breakfast seemed to go off well. We thank the downtown organization and Santa Barbara's finest, Santa Barbara Police Department, for their support in our allowing us to close State Street. It's a unique event. It'll be over in about 15 minutes, and uh, I think it works successfully. I personally thank our board members and the support I've gotten uh, from Ed Edick, who chairs this event and is responsible not only for uh, making sure the trains run on time, but also making sure the weather was good yet again this year. And then the inimitable friend, Dijon, whose uh, support as lead of the sponsorship committee has just been vital. Um, our executive director, Peter Rupert, from whom you'll hear in a moment, is, uh, of course, of national reputation and a quality speaker. And UCSB, uh, we'll hear from David Marshall, the executive vice chancellor, in a moment. But this is our primary interaction with the university, between the business community and the university, and we really value it. Each of you should have in your hand, in your uh, booklet, uh, a, an evaluation form, which we urge each of you to fill out. I assure you all of the board members read each of those and they affect the way we run the event. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce David Marshall, Executive Vice Chancellor of the University of California at Santa Barbara. David. Thank you. Well, I'm very glad to be here this morning and on behalf of the University of California, Santa Barbara, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 34th annual Santa Barbara County Economic Summit, the annual update of UC Santa Barbara's economic forecast project. Chancellor Yang is not able to be here today, but he sends his greetings and best wishes. So I'd like to thank Mike Fow and Professor Peter Rupert for their leadership and to thank everyone who came together to organize such an interesting program today. UC Santa Barbara takes its role as a public research university very seriously. It's part of our mission to partner with our local business and professional community, to share our scholarship and knowledge, to provide a forum for dialogue, discussion, and debate, and to advance our common goal of making Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara County a desirable place to live and work. As a great public research university, the University of California also contributes to our crucial knowledge economy. Our most recent Nobel Prize winner, Professor Suji Nakamura, the inventor of the blue LED, stands as a good example of how scientific research can have an impact on both quality of life and the economy. Last year alone, the University of California produced 1,700 inventions. That's an average of five per day. The university, the university of California generates more than $46 billion in economic activity every year. Every dollar invested by California taxpayers results in $10 in gross state product and $14 in overall economic impact. But beyond this specific economic impact, we educate our students to become informed and engaged citizens in California, to become the workforce that California needs to be a leader in our 21st century economy. Although we give our students specialized training in many areas, perhaps our most important contribution is to give them the skills of critical thinking and communication, to prepare them for careers in which collaboration and innovation and creativity will be crucial. We give them an understanding of society, culture, and the diverse traditions that compose California that will help them function in both our global 
economy and in the multicultural and multilingual state that is a microcosm of our global society. I often tell freshmen that we are preparing them for the jobs that don't exist today, the jobs and the markets that they will help invent. We are also, by the way, an engine of social mobility. More than 40% of our students are the first in their families to get a college education. So if you'll allow me to briefly engage in some economic forecasting, I'd like to note that according to the Public Policy Institute of California, the state's economy is going to continue to need highly educated workers. In 2025, according to the Institute, if current trends persist, 41% of jobs will require at least a bachelor's degree. Yet, Population and education trends suggest that by 2025, only 35% of working age adults in California will have bachelor's degrees. So that equates to a shortfall of one million college graduates with a bachelor's degree. California's future depends on the future of public education. 75% of the bachelor's degrees awarded annually in this state come from either the University of California or the California State University. So the economic forecast for California depends on the economic forecast for public education. Let me close by mentioning just one other topic of interest to Santa Barbara County. Following the leadership of Chancellor Yang, UC Santa Barbara has spent the last year working to improve our community of Isla Vista. Faculty, staff, administrators, trustees, and students have invested their time energy, expertise, and imagination. And we have committed literally millions of dollars with the goal of making Isla Vista a safe and vibrant community with a sustainable and diverse economy and a culture that is commensurate with the academic quality and mission of UC Santa Barbara. So looking out at this audience today filled with so many business leaders and policymakers and influential citizens, I see many potential partners, and I hope that you will join us in this enterprise. But for the moment, let me thank you for attending today, and I'm sure that you will enjoy and benefit from the program that is planned for this morning. Thank you, and I'm now going to turn it over to Peter Rupert. Thank you, David, Mike. Uh, it's, it's great. Uh, thank everybody for coming. Our sponsors, wonderful. I also have to tell you that this can't be done without a whole bunch of things happening. And we have many, many people, volunteers, working outside, working backstage. And I just want to thank Susan and Nora and everybody and the interns uh, for, for your hard work. So oftentimes, in the past, we've had some Federal Reserve officials, presidents of Federal Reserve banks, this year, I decided we're already confused enough, and no sense inviting any of them. It's also the 34th year in a row we have not invited Paul Krugman to talk. <clears throat> so anyway, we have a new website. Please you know, take a look at it. I'll explain more later. It's www.efp.ucsb.edu. So it's efp.ucsb.edu. So before I, I introduce our keynote speaker, Mark Flannery, again, I just want to thank, that, thank our sponsors. We have a bunch of new sponsors. It's wonderful. We've had a, a record year in, in our support, so that's wonderful. And uh, it, it's been great, and it's, 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 a, it's a great environment. So now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mark Flannery. Mark Flannery is the chief economist and director of um, the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. And we decided this year we're going to randomly select one individual here and go through their books uh, very carefully <laughs> with Mark here. I'm just waiting to see if anybody runs out of the room right now, and we'll, ca we'll catch you. Uh, Mark has, has, has been there about a year, I think. We tried to get him last year, but he had just started and said he wants to get a little bit more knowledge about what's going on. And he's a, he used to be a professor at the University of Florida. He's on leave. And he's going to talk about capital formation for small businesses. So please help me welcome Mark Flannery. Well, 
thank you very much, Peter. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you for inviting me to participate in your economic summit and the economic forecasting project. Um, you know, I don't like mornings very well, but when you fly from west to east to west the night before, the morning doesn't seem so bad. I thought I'd be in better shape than a lot of people here, but I showed up for breakfast, and everybody's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, so um, I guess I, I lost my, ad my advantage. What I'd like to do this morning is talk to you about two closely related things that the SEC spends a lot of time thinking about. One is investor protection, and the other is capital raising, particularly for small businesses, which has been a continuing issue uh, in, in, in the SEC and in the, the greater economy. Before I start, I need to make a disclaimer, which is that um, my views that I will express are entirely my own. They have nothing to do with SEC policy, nor I'm told do they have anything to do with my colleagues at the SEC's opinions. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I'm, I'm speaking only for myself. And before getting to the two topics that I really want to spend some time on, I also thought that I'd tell you a little bit about what the SEC looks like. Now, this is partly for me to make sure I've got it right, because when they called me last year around this time and said, was I interested in the job, I said, you must have the wrong number. Um, I'm a bank regulatory economist, not a securities market economist. Um, so I'll give you some numbers if you like, but, but um, I'm the wrong guy. So I essentially got moved out of a venue where I was able to see banking policy made by kind of looking over the fence. I knew a bunch of people at the Fed. I'd spent some time at the Fed in New York. And I, I, I did policy by looking over the fence. And then in this new job, I'm right in the middle of the sausage factory. I'm looking around at the floor of the sausage factory, wondering how it all gets done and how it all makes sense. Um, so let me give you a little tour of, of the SEC. First of all, the commission dates to 1934. Joe, Joe Kennedy was the first commissioner. Uh, the first chair of the commission. And the mission is to protect investors, to maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. So those are the three things, and I'm, I'm really surprised at how many times I've heard people list them as part of our mission as by way of, of orienting a discussion or starting a policy, uh, uh, policy proposal. So the commission regulates the key participants throughout the securities markets. Um, which includes the exchanges, brokers and dealers, investment advisors, mutual funds, and credit rating agencies. We focus on promoting disclosure. I'll talk a little bit more about what it means to be a disclosure agency. We focus on promoting disclosure of important information about securities that are being sold and issued to the public. We have an inspection program for securities firms, for investment advisors, for brokers, um, whereby we go and, and check compliance with, uh, with the disclosure requirements and also check compliance for the broker-dealers with the uh, solvency requirements and the capital requirements that make sure that the customers of the broker-dealers, if something happens to the dealer, the customers are going to get their money anyhow. So to do all of this, oh, and the other thing I should say is um, the, the, the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the people who bring you GARP, or GAP, not GARP, GAP, uh, <laughs> Are, are a, a creature of the SEC. Um, so if you, if you like GAP, then you like the FASB, and it's our fault. If you don't like GAP, it must be somebody else's fault. Um, to do all this work, we have essentially five divisions and a great big office. So you can think of it as six major divisions inside the SEC. The first one is corporate finance, and they are in charge of overseeing corporate disclosures. So when a security when you want to issue a security, you register with the commission, you describe the security, you describe the risks, and the, office, the Division of Corporation Finance determines whether there's enough information there that people can understand what they're being asked to buy. Um, then there's the Division of Trading and Markets, and they're in charge of the plumbing. They're in charge of the plumbing of the, of the securities exchange system, so they worry about the exchanges, they worry about the trading firms, usually broker-dealers. Um, they worry about the clearing agencies that facilitate a trade. Some of you who are familiar with buying stock and selling stock may not know that there's this plumbing where there are agencies that essentially, not federal agencies, but there are agents who make sure that if I buy a stock from you, you get my money and I get your stock. 
That's a big part of making a market work. Um, and, and they also oversee the people who bring you the, the stock market ticker. So when you go to Yahoo or you go to wherever you, you go for your stock information, that is a feed off of, of, of an information processor whose operations are overseen by the SEC. Um, the other thing that the Trading and Markets Group does is they oversee SIPC, the Security Investor Protection Corporation, which is to broker-dealers the same way the FDIC is to banks. If you are holding securities in street name and you've got a cash account at your broker and the broker goes under, first of all, there are lots of protections in place that are meant to make sure that the broker doesn't go under far enough to take any of your securities with him or her. But the SIPC will come in if you lose money and make you whole again. And that's under the Division of Trading and Markets. Then there's the Division of Investment Management. That's our third division, Corporate Finance, Trading and Markets, Investment Management. They regulate the $26 trillion fund industry in the US. So that's just in the US. That's mutual funds and hedge funds and a, a set of investment advisors, registered investment advisors, who provide advice to individuals about what kinds of securities they could buy, what sort of portfolio they should, they should have. The Division of Enforcement is the one that's the most fun to read about in the newspaper. They investigate alleged violation of securities laws and then they prosecute on the basis, uh, on the behalf of the commission. One of the ways that they get tips, they, they do a lot of looking around, they do a lot of investigation, the, the um, agencies, the, the uh, exchanges do a lot of investigation looking for suspicious insider trading patterns and things like that. So there's a merger announced on Thursday and there was a huge increase in buying volume Wednesday afternoon. Was that coincidence? or can we figure out that maybe somebody had inside information and made the markets unfair in that context? One of the interesting things about um, the enforcement process is we invented this thing called the, the Tips, Complaints, and Referrals Line, TCR. It, it might as well be called the Bernie Madoff Retribution Line <laughs> because it went into effect shortly after Bernie was discovered. Um, we get 40,000 tips, complaints, and referrals a year. And each one, it's a computerized system. You can find it on the web page. Each one of those complaints is registered and transported to somebody in enforcement, a real person, who looks at the situation and decides if it bears further investigation. Um, if you know of something nefarious going on, you can also register there as a whistleblower. And whistleblowers are, are able to collect substantial amounts of money. I think the, the first payment we made was last week. It was about $26 million. Um, I didn't get a share of that. I was very disappointed. But uh, so that's the Division of Enforcement. And then there's the Office of Compliance, Inspections, and Examinations. They have about 500 examiners, and they're responsible for overseeing about 10,000 entities. So you do the math. That's 20 a year for each individual. And it's pretty clear that we're not going to get to everybody. And so that serves as a nice transition to my division, DIRA, the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis. One of the things we help them do is we help them identify statistical irregularities in the reports that are filed by the, the investment advisors and the mutual funds that OC, Office of Compliance, Inspection and Exams, that OC oversees. So we help them sort of risk adjust the list of, of entities they're gonna go out and examine. And we'll say, based on what we see in the, the reported information, here's what I'd be on the lookout for. You know, if they might have had, it might be a mutual fund with an extraordinarily large inflow of purchases at the end of every quarter. Might be a good reason for that, but it would be a good idea for OC to understand what's going on. So, so we, do a lot of, we do a lot of the, the risk uh, analytics underlying um, the scheduling of, of OC exams. So the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis, DIRA, um, has about 140 people working there. Now, the, the, that doesn't sound like many. It was a lot to me. I've never run a lemonade stand before. But it was a, it's a lot for me, but it's not a lot, perhaps, um, if you think about overseeing the economics of the Securities Exchange Commission. But five years ago, there were more like 40 people or 45 people. And there were a couple of very embarrassing DC district court cases where the judges said to some SEC lawyers, how do you expect me to approve this agreement? There's no economic analysis in it. Go home. And it was very public and very embarrassing. 
And it started a movement inside the commission that is really quite an extraordinary transformation where until five years ago, if the economists were consulted, it was on the way out the door. The lawyer said, here's a settlement we're proposing, write something to justify it. Or here's a rule we're thinking about, write a little bit of, about why it's a good idea. Now we're involved from the very beginning when there's a rule to be written. So, um, for example, I had a conversation a couple of months ago with one of the other directors, and they wanted to write a rule a certain way, and I said, that doesn't make any sense. And he said, yeah, here's how it makes sense. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't think we can write an economic analysis that would justify that approach to the problem. And we, all, we talked about it for another 45 minutes, and, and the rule as proposed is different from what they had proposed before, and I think better. So we are involved at the beginning. We're very active in, in advising on policy, and unusually in the federal government, every rule or regulation that the SEC implements is accompanied by a cost-benefit analysis, an economic analysis. So we can't say, if you, if you remember cost-benefit analysis, if you've ever taken a, a corporate finance co uh, course, say, um, you would add up all the dollars on one side, and the benefits, the cost, you'd discount them back to the same point in time. We don't get to do that very often because, for example, what is the dollar value of a better informed investor? I'm pretty sure it's positive, but I don't know how positive it is. So what we do is we, we essentially say things like, this rule will make investors better informed and that's a good thing. It comes at the following cost. Here's what we estimate the cost to be because we can estimate the costs a little bit better um, than, than a dollar amount of the benefits. And then the commissioners decide how to, how to make the balance. So we're involved in a lot of that. We're very data and, and um, data intensive and, and analytical. Um, one of the data feeds that we get coming from the options exchanges, one day of data, all of the quotes, all of the transactions, is five billion lines. So that means that during the day there were five billion transactions or quotes. So you've heard about high, high frequency trading, and that, in, that turns into this five billion dollar, five billion line file where uh, people put out trades for a very short time, they put out offers, and then they pull them back. And so there are a lot of offers, there are a lot of quotes per um, dollar of transactions or per transaction. So we spend a lot of time working with big data sets. Why? Because we're interested in making sure that the markets are working well. We're interested in knowing some of the characteristics about trading in various parts of the market because they will, those characteristics will inform how we think about possible uh, rule, rule innovations and we'll think about whether rules need to be changed. So one of the things DIRA does, one of the first questions we ask is, what's the problem with the world as it exists? What are we trying to fix? And sometimes that generates a, a fairly heated discussion because it's obvious to say trading and markets that there's a problem, but they have to explain it to us, or when they go to explain it to us sometimes, it's not really a problem or the problem lies somewhere else. So that, that's the function of adding economic analysis to an, uh, uh, an agency that is very lawyer heavy. It's a different way of thinking about things and we're very interested in what the data say to the extent that we can make the data tell us things that are relevant. So, so that's the tour of the commission. That's my tour of the commission. Let me turn now to the two concerns I wanted to talk about. One of which is the definition of an accredited investor. And very, very closely related to that is the set of rules about raising capital for small businesses, for small firms. The definition of an accredited investor, um, one definition of it comes out of a 1953 Supreme Court case and an accredited investor there was described as somebody who could fend for himself. That was before we said himself or herself. So the Supreme Court in 1953 wanted people who were accredited to be able to fend for themselves in securities markets. What does that mean? How would you know one if you saw one? We all know people who can obviously fend for themselves very well. We all know people who can't. And then the question is, can you draw a line that separates those two groups? Well, in 1983, they did draw a line. First attempt to define an accredited investor in 1983 said that an accredited investor has at least $200,000 a year of income, 
where a couple has 300,000, and an accredited investor has a net worth of a million dollars or more. So it's purely income related. And at the time, 1.5% of US households were accredited. They could fend for themselves. The rest, under this definition, needed some protection. So being accredited has come to mean two different things, or two related things. One is, do you understand the risks and returns associated with the investment you're being asked to buy when someone's selling you a security? The second is, can you afford to lose money if the investment turns out badly? So in a sense, it's, it's, it's a little bit paternalistic, but that's not unique to the SEC. It's not unique to the securities markets. Um, and, and the SEC has divided the world into accredited investors who don't require as much protection or oversight over the information that they are provided versus non-accredited investors who provide a lot more protection. Now, this distinction is not unique to the SEC. I've always thought of commercial banks as entities that are allowed to sell securities, bank deposits or bonds. They're allowed to sell securities without registering any information, without telling you anything. When was the last time you went into a bank and said, um, my, my child would like to open a, uh, an account to put his paper route money into, could I please see a financial statement? Well, the child is not sophisticated enough. Many parents are not sophisticated enough. But we have a, a, a regulatory superstructure around the banks, the deposit-taking entities, that essentially says that we're going to make sure that these entities have a limited range of activities and they have enough capital to protect the depositors from loss. And if that fails, we've got the FDIC. Okay, so that's, a, that's an example of where we set up a, a prudential regulatory structure, and I'm sure there are many people here who think that's an excessive structure, but let's not get into that. We set up a regulatory structure such that it is safe for uninformed or unaccredited investors to buy the securities of that firm. Now, those bank regulators are prudential regulators, which means that they have an opinion about the appropriate default probability, the appropriate riskiness of a bank. So they, they look at the bank, they evaluate the risks, they look at the leverage, and they determine whether the bank is or is not sufficiently safe. And the SEC, by contrast, doesn't make a judgment like that. The SEC is a disclosure agency. It's qualitatively different. This is a really important distinction between the banks and the bank regulators and the SEC. The SEC says essentially, if people are provided with appropriate information, they can judge for themselves whether they want to take risks. And then the accredited investor definition says, but different people have different abilities to judge for themselves. So the SEC has a mechanism in place where there are certain accredited investors who are allowed to buy whatever they like. If you're selling securities in, in your coffee shop, you can go to an accredited investor and try to sell shares but you may not go to an unaccredited investor because, in a sense, the, the balance isn't viewed as being fair between the seller, who's pretty well informed, and the buyer, who's not so well informed. Now, this comes up in mutual funds. Um, everybody knows what a mutual fund is, I, I, I hope. There are about 10,000 of them in the US. Together, they manage about $17 trillion in assets, which is a little more than 20% of US wealth. And mutual funds are a mechanism whereby individuals hire an advisor who buys a portfolio of stocks for them. And so the SEC pays a lot of attention to the advisor and whether the advisor is appropriately describing the risks of the investment. Because in fact, any old investor, accredited or not, may buy a mutual fund. We see ads on television and in the newspaper for mutual funds. Whereas we don't see ads at the Super Bowl saying, how would you like to buy a privately placed security from a Cayman subsidiary of a hedge fund that works out of Chicago? Okay? That is not appropriate for an unaccredited or unsophisticated investor, whereas the mutual funds are. So there's this sort of protection idea in mutual funds. And the protection idea is, is kind of a nice idea, but it runs right into the question of, where do we get capital, and where do we get capital for small businesses who need to build things? And so that's the second part of what I really want to talk about, which is this, this security issue. Oh, I know, I, I see a note here. I want to go back and, and tell you one fact, one fact to take home. 
Um, I always thought that mutual funds, at the end of the day, I say sell my shares, redeem my shares. I thought they'd pay me the next day automatically. In fact, they do, generally. But the Investment Act of 1940 says that they have up to seven days to pay you. Now, I didn't know that. So I would have been very shocked if I sold some funds and I got a note from the mutual fund manager saying, oh, well, we'll give you your money in a week or so. Don't worry, we're fine, but we, won't, we can't give you your money for another week or so. So the, the law says that the funds have to pay back within seven days. The custom has evolved to the point that everybody thinks that automatically mutual funds pay back the next day because in everybody's experience, they do. Um, but even, a credit, unaccredited, even accredited investors would probably be surprised to hear that it's possible you might have to work, wait for your money. Okay, so security issuance, and security issuance particularly by smaller companies. Um, there are limits and restrictions on who, whom you may solicit if you're selling securities, whom may you contact and try to induce to buy your securities. And that goes to the distinction between accredited and unaccredited. The SEC provides and requires a lot more information, much more extensive reporting, audited financial statements for issuers of securities that are going to be sold to unaccredited, unsophisticated individuals. So there are annual reports 10Ks, there are quarterly reports 10Qs, and just in case something happens in between, there are, uh, there are as of reports or, or incident by incident reports 8Ks. They all become public, they're all on the, the SEC's website. If you're worried about your company, you can go look at the SEC website, look at all their recent filings, and, and see what, what they have to tell you. The production of these documents, though, is expensive. And particularly, it, it, it surprises me regularly to find out what, the, what audited financial statements cost relative to just the preparation. The audited financial statements, um, particularly for a complicated firm, tend to cost quite a lot of money. So a company issuing securities or thinking about issuing securities has to balance the cost of issuing registered securities, which comes with a lot of relatively expensive reporting requirements, balance that cost against the benefit of getting funds to invest. And for small companies, since the, the cost of getting that audited report is, is, has a big fixed cost component, you know, if, if I'm one-tenth as large as you, my, audited, my audit doesn't cost 10% of what yours costs. There's kind of a fixed cost component. And so the fear is that small companies find it too expensive to issue registered securities, which are the securities you can sell to anybody, accredited or unaccredited. Now, there have long been exceptions to this registration requirement, or I should say not exceptions so much as an alternative registration light. Um, it's called Reg D, Regulation D, and if you want a relatively small amount of money or you are willing to sell securities only to accredited investors and in some cases under Reg D, only restricted securities that may not be sold again for two years, which from an investor's perspective is, is sometimes a drawback and therefore makes the money more expensive. Under Reg D, you can approach accredited investors and sell a fair amount of unregistered or registered light securities where the idea is that the accredited investors can decide if they're willing to invest on the basis of, unaccred of, of unaudited financial statements. Um, it turns out that about a trillion dollars of capital was raised last year through these Reg D exemptions, through these regulation light exemptions. But they're not regular stocks, so if you look in the paper and you see someone selling $300 million of new shares, that's going to be a registered offering because it's available to all investors. It's going to have a lot of, of reporting infrastructure associated with it. And um, that market raised last year about $1.3 trillion in much bigger increments. The Reg D market, or the Reg D alternative registration light, raised about a billion, a trillion, I'm sorry, a trillion, but um, it is a little bit harder to sell you can't advertise as broadly, and it is sometimes restricted stock, which is more expensive to sell because the buyer is stuck with it for two years. So last month, the commission introduced a new exemption from full registration, and that's a, 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 an exception under what's called, or an exemption under what's called Regulation A. 
Now, there was a Regulation A five years ago that would allow the issuance of up to $10 million of securities. It required registration with the SEC and registration with state securities officials in any state that you were going to sell into. Um, and as I said, it was a maximum of $10 million. So there wasn't a lot that you could raise, although though there are many Reg D offerings of that size. That's the other exemption, Reg D. Um, but it was awkward, and it involved in particular getting approval from all of the state commissioners of, of securities where you were going to sell. Hardly anybody used that Regulation A, so it didn't turn out to be a very useful way for small companies to raise new capital. The new and revised Regulation A, Reg A+, plus, says if you're going to, there are two ways you can do this now. You can go with very little information provided, but you need to get the approval of the state commissioner of securities, and that takes a long time, which was one of the problems. Or you can provide a little bit more information, not as much as full registration, but a little bit more information, and you can issue these securities to any investor accredited or otherwise. So the difference from Reg D, you can only go to accredited investors, basically. To Reg A, you can sell to anyone. So you can now, under Reg A, you can sell securities. I, 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 don't, I don't think you take out an ad in the paper, but you, can, you don't have to be sure that this is an accredited investor you're talking to. Now, a very large fraction of the Reg D issuances last year, the $1 trillion, would fit nicely into this new Reg A, which limits uh, security sales to a maximum of $50 million a year. But there are a lot of small issues. So potentially, this new Reg A plus will change the way that small businesses raise capital. It'll make it easier for small businesses to raise capital. It'll certainly make it cheaper for small businesses to raise capital. The interesting complement to that, okay, it's cheaper, but with less documentation, less information provided, are we going to find investors who are willing to take a chance on the securities? So that question really is, what's the value of the information provided under mandatory disclosure, for example, audited financials? What's the value to an investor, and is there a set of investors that are willing to buy stock without audited financials because they think they can fend for themselves? And that's what we don't know yet. That's what we don't know yet. But very clearly what's going on here is a distinction between um, the ability to raise capital cheaply and investor protection. We're sort of opening the gates to allow firms under Reg A to sell securities, issue securities, mostly stock, but bonds as well, to unaccredited investors on the basis of an abbreviated or um, a disclosure light kind of information regime. So there's no guarantee that there'll be people, enough people, who are willing to buy securities under these conditions. Furthermore, there's no guarantee that if those securities get bought and sold initially, that a market for the trading of those securities will develop. Because in the absence of, let me be careful how I say this, I'll say in the absence of full disclosure as required by the, the usual securities issuance, the people who might buy and sell those securities might say, I don't really understand what I'm buying. It takes a lot of trouble to figure out what this company is about because I have somewhat less information. So I'm not really interested in buying securities and on exchange. And if someone's not interested in buying, no one's interested in selling. So there remains the question about whether these small issuances will wind up getting traded on an exchange. Now, there have been efforts over the past three or four years to start venture exchanges, exchanges that would, in fact, trade very small firms uh, and a market that looks qualitatively somewhat like our national, our national market. Um, the SEC in 2011 permitted, approved the, the operation of one of these exchanges, and they haven't opened up yet. And we think that the main reason is that, that information is very expensive in those markets. You can't buy or sell a lot of stock anyhow because the ownership is all split up. Um, and if you wanted to spend a lot of time investigating the company, you'd have trouble buying enough of the company so that if it was undervalued, you could cover your cost of investigation. So that, that 
remains to be seen whether the secondary market turns out to be a major impediment, but it hasn't been in the Reg D market where a lot of similar securities arise. So I think the takeaway from Reg A plus is that there's now a broader set of people you can approach to buy your securities. You can do it with a less burdensome and therefore less um, expensive enforce, uh, information disclosure regime. And what the commission had to do, and we laid this out, and we said, you know, on the one hand, you're, you're going to get less investor protection a little bit. On the other hand, you're going to get cheaper access to capital by small firms. That's why they pay the commissioners the big bucks. That's why the president appoints them. They get to make a decision about whether or not the benefits exceed the costs. And last month, in the case of Regulation A+, they decided that they do. So that has the potential, really quite substantially, to change the market for small stocks and the excess access that small companies have to equity funds that they can use to finance their operations. Now let me finish with a little more information, just a little more thinking about this concept of accredited investor, because as you can see, it makes a big difference in the sale of stocks, how you can sell and issue stocks initially. So if you remember what I said was that in 1983, when the first official definition of a fend for yourself individual came along, you have $200,000 of income, a million dollars of net worth. A little while later, they took your house out of the definition of net worth. They left in your mortgage for you, but they took your house out. But in the beginning, there was no exclusion based on the house. Um, and we had 1.5% of households that were able to fend for themselves by this definition. Well, of course, we've had inflation since 1983, a little bit under 3% a year. And $200,000 of income, which used to be a lot, is now a lot, but not quite as much of a lot. And so now, something like 12% of US households qualify under this income or net worth requirement as accredited investors. And when I see that number, the first thing that occurs to me is, what changed in the markets that made it necessary to protect all but 1.5% in 1983, and now we can protect all but 12%? Was the 1983 number wrong? Is the current situation wrong? How should we think about this accredited investor issue um, from the perspective that the SEC has? There are some obvious problems with an income, uh, with an income requirement. Suppose you're a ball player. Ball players are famous for making a lot of money and retiring broke. So they're not very sophisticated, yet anybody who has a, a, a weird deal to sell can go and pitch it to a ball player who makes $200,000 a year, um, if you can find one that makes that little. When I was an assistant professor, we used to sit around and complain that we couldn't be, we couldn't, as assistant finance professors, we weren't informed or accredited investors because we didn't make enough. Um, and we thought if only you know, we, we could become accredited investors, we were smart enough to figure out where the, the real returns lie. So there are people who might be pretty well informed, but not past the income uh, hurdle. CPA is the same sort of thing. Do CPAs know enough to fend for themselves? I'm sure many do. Um, and they may not all pass the, uh, the income. There's another question. Suppose I'm an investor, and I'm working through an investment advisor. So I go to an investment advisor who's running my portfolio for me. Does that make me accredited because I've got a smart person working for me? Then there's also been a lot of discussion lately about having investment experience. So suppose I don't make $200,000, but I've got three quarters of a million dollars in securities. Um, does that make me informed enough if I have put together a portfolio of securities? Well, of course, the first thing you might think of is, I haven't put the portfolio together at all. My parents just passed away, and I inherited their money. So I don't know anything more about finances than I did before. So all of these bright lines have some problems with them. And the Dodd-Frank Act required that the SEC reconsider the definition of an accredited investor. And we're in the process of doing that. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, I think there are lots of people out in, in the world who would like to know where it's going to go. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're sort of balancing some of these questions about what makes somebody accredited, who needs protection, who can't figure out risks, and who doesn't know that they can't really afford 
to take uh, big losses. So those two things, again, I'll, I'll, I'll finish where I started. Those two things, again, the definition of accredited and the access, the terms on which small companies are able to access capital markets and sell shares to individuals, those two things are tied together. Those two things are very important parts of what the SEC does. And to come back to the plug for DERA for the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis, we're in the middle of trying to figure out what we can learn from the data about who's sophisticated and who's not. Thank you very much for your attention.